What? That, that, wait, that was your first offer? First show was the Jantana Classic Masters Mr. Olympia. And the next year, I was the onstage host for the Olympia. Some of it's still me. I've still got things I'm trying to prove to me. I still love the discipline. I still love the process. I still love banging the weights and knowing that I still have it, that I still have the discipline to get the job done. But I thought at that point, if I was going to overcome every fear I've ever had, I was all going to do it at once. And, and that was the Marines. And it was a great call because it, it, it changed who I was for the rest of my life. The feeling of entertaining the troops, go, knowing what they're going through, going to them and being a part and giving them two hours with the other comedians I was with to just forget everything and shut down and laugh was the greatest experience ever. All right, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Bodybuilding Breakdown. I'm joined today by Tim Wilkins, bodybuilding commentator, men's physique competitor, Marine Corps member, actor, comedian. Tim, welcome to the channel. We got a lot we can go over. Welcome. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Now, nah, it's great to have you on. It's great to have you on. I've, uh, I've got a number of things that I want to ask you about here. You know, when I was looking at uh, having you on the show here, most people know you from Olympia TV, of course, in the bodybuilding space. But what a lot of people may not know is some of your some of your other accolades when it comes to acting, comedy, I mean, in, in Marine Corps, how all of those things have kind of all tied together in your life as well. But everything seems to come back to training, bodybuilding, you know. <laughs> that's that's really so where it started. Cool. Actually, those two things kind of crisscrossed. I wanted to be a stand up comedian since I was six, seven years old. It's all I wanted to do. And then at about 14, 15, I found the weight room and actually grew up in Southern California. So my best friend and I would go down to Venice Beach, poke our head over the uh, fence at, at Muscle Beach, watch the pros train, started going into a Venice Golds at 16, 17. And uh, I've always been just addicted to bodybuilding and uh, and then got into stand-up comedy for 33 years. So we'll, we'll get into the comedy, but you were actually in Gold's Venice at that time being being that like of of that age what what years were you actually at gold's venice uh 85 to 87 85 to 87 man that's like things were booming there like that was that was the oh, time to be there it was incredible and uh it was a, a lot cleaner back then on the streets of venice and a lot safer for a teenager to be roaming around and my buddy and i all we wanted to do was go in train around the pros we had a couple of spots we liked to go eat. There was a place that served a burrito that looked like a babe, fat baby's leg. And uh, it was about four bucks full of chicken and rice. There was another place that nice. sold an entire rotisserie chicken for $5. And we would just go train our butts off and then eat and eat and eat. And I go to the firehouse and wait for pros to come in like Bob Chicarillo back in the day, who you just had on the show, uh, who now has a, a menu item named after him. Uh, but that was the that was the place to be back in the 80s. I've heard Dave Palumbo speak of the fire host, Lee Priest. Yeah, that was a very, very popular spot for bodybuilders. Like, that's what that's what everybody said you would do. You go from the gym down to the fire host. And that was the that like that was one of the iconic things down there. So that's that's actually really cool, man. I didn't know that you were part of that that scene in, the, in that in that era. That's actually really cool. Uh, it, it was really cool just to be around. And we still had the magazines back then. So, and of course, everything was on a three month delay, but you'd get your magazines and you couldn't wait to see the guys that you watched that you do looked up to come in and have pancakes. That's all you wanted to do. I don't want to watch Milos Sarshev eat pancakes, you know, or whatever he was eating back in there, probably chicken and rice because he was genius, um, still is. But to be just involved in that. And now my wife teases me. We're talking, what is that? Almost 40 years later, I'm still a giant fanboy. I'm still the one when I'm in Olympia, I'm at the press conference, I'm at the Meet the Olympia nights. And uh, my wife said, you, it, I'm going to go say hi to that guy. She said, he's your friend. You've known him for 15 years. Yeah, but I want to get his autograph. Don't be an idiot. You're friends. You have him in your phone. You probably interviewed him there not long ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. That's I understand, though. I do. I understand. I would probably be the same way. You know, I'd probably be the same. Of course, you've you've been around the industry. A lot longer than I have. You've been you've been right in the thick of it too. I mean, commentating shows, the Olympia. I mean, it's 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 unbelievable. But it you're still an active competitor as well. 
I just competed at uh, Masters Nationals uh, a few weeks ago in Pittsburgh um, in the over 50 in the over 55 division. And uh, I've been top five pretty much every time at Masters Nationals and cracked second. I got so close to the pro card. Um, it was so amazing just to be out there after all these years. That's, that's one of the things I still love about being a part of the sport and commentating on the sport is I'm still dieting. I'm still doing the cardio. I'm still buried in it. So I have such a huge appreciation for what these men and women do to get on stage in that condition. Well, not my condition, pro condition, but I do a lot of NPC shows as well. Anybody getting on stage, I know and I appreciate what they're going through. Well, Tim, you didn't just compete this year. You did seven shows this year. Is that right? Uh, I did three. I did three, but oh, you I did, did three. Uh, I did three. I did uh, the chiseled in Boca North Americans that we don't talk about and uh, Masters Nationals that went very well. All right. NPC News Online lied to me then because it said seven on there. There you go. I'm blaming them. <laughs> Thank you, J.M. Mannion. But, I'll take it. Yeah, really, though. Yeah, really, though. But no, even to do three shows at you, at, like you said, the 55 plus category, that's very respectful. What is it that keeps you going wanting to compete at this age? Some of it's still me. I've still got things I'm trying to prove to me uh and other things now i coach a ton of kids i got a lot of peers a lot of people that go i'm feeding off of your energy i still love i still love the discipline i still love the process i still love banging the weights i love uh I love having all that bland food that everybody else is cringing about in some kind of a Tupperware container when everybody else is having their fun and knowing that I still have it, that I still have the discipline to get the job done and I'm still improving. So I'm super happy about that. You know, uh, it was hard this year. Like I, I joke about North Americans, you get backstage, the old guys start sizing each other up. Go, that guy looks awesome. Is he my age? I wonder if he's my age. And you, you try to figure out by the wrinkles in his face or the gray in his hair they started to call my division in over 50 and we start counting the numbers 151 152 you're going no there's six guys there's eight guys there was 18 guys in the over 50 and they wow. were amazing 13 guys in the over 55 in my height class in my height class over 50 d there was 18 amazing physiques i said what did you do empty out a retirement home of the biggest studs you could find I and mean, this is a calendar for old <laughs> ladies there was a lot of great guys over 50, and it's just inspirational as hell. Well, you see men's physique that has a lot of competitors traditionally to go through the classes of, of men's physique at the NPC level, at the IFBB level. Typically, it is many, many competitors that you'll see in any given show. So we're, you, you see that also in, even in the over 50 portions of, uh, com of competing. These guys are just getting better, and I think right now, as the economy is a little tough, they're the only ones that have the mature muscle and the disposable income to get their butts on stage. So they're they're just these guys are just getting better and better. I kept thinking when I was 44, oh, 45 is going to be easy. They're old. And at 50 at 49 and 50 and 54, I think, oh, when I turn 55, it's a bunch of old retired guys. These guys are awesome. It's really, it's really inspiring and really, it really sucks at the same time because I really wanted that pro card this year. And uh it just turned out there was just one guy better. Just one. <sighs> You hear that countless times as well. But if you can take second, you can certainly take first at any given show. So, and no doubt you're going to keep at it. And I, th I think you will get that card. I mean, you know, there's no reason why you won't. You already finished second. Next show. Well, they had counterfeit COVID cards. I'm thinking about a counterfeit IFBB pro card. I'm thinking about, you know, no one will notice. Yeah, they will. They yeah, will. they will. You're right. They will. <laughs> yeah. No, we put COVID behind us, thankfully. But no, that's actually really cool. When did you switch to men's physique? Did and, and what were you competing in before men's physique? Uh, before they had classic, they only had bodybuilding, and uh, I don't have the legs for it, so I couldn't have been any happier with men's physique. Uh, if they come out with a division with pants, I'm in. If there's something to the floor. <laughs> Something a little longer than a pedal pusher or capri pant. Something that shows zero calf where they can't even judge ankle. I want something, you know, with a nice single break in the dress shoe. Um, I was in uh, I was in bodybuilding when they had class. I love I still love the poses. I still love looking at a guy like uh, uh, Lee Labrada, um, who, who I got to train with recently at the win the day gym that they built at the Labrada headquarters. Very cool, dude. Very cool. So he's giving me the tour, says, have fun, go to town, man. And uh, and then he stopped and he goes, hey, what are you training today? Um, training chest. Goes, Mind if I work out with you? Dude, it's on Little Timmy's Make-A-Wish. Yes, Mr. Labrada, you can train with me at your, at your own massive gym. Let's do that. 
Did you get did did you film that? No, I I, I had to film it in here, unfortunately. But <laughs> it was it was awesome. I was fifty pounds stronger than I've ever been in my life. I bet you were. I bet you were. Probably <laughs> the next five workouts probably hit you up like that, man. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. See, these are the things. These are the experiences that you get to have based on you know your career working in this uh, in this industry. Aside from competing. How is it that you started doing commentate like commentating for shows? When did you get into that? So that is a great story. So I was doing stand up comedy. I kind of maxed out stand up comedy. Was kind of at the top level that I could be at at the time. And my mentor said, "Hey man," I said, "I either got to make more money or switch jobs or something. I, I want to do something better that I enjoy." And he said, "You should write jokes about bodybuilding. You love bodybuilding." So I I did a gig. I, I drove eleven hours to a show show slept an hour and then drove to the arnold classic about another 12 hours through literally rain sleet and snow and was going to sleep on my buddy's floor and walk around and hand out business cards i went downstairs to the breakfast buffet and the woman who used to do the tanning for that show her name was jan tana i meet her in the elevator and she said do, do you have a car could you take me for a ride to the show and uh on the way over she said so why are you in town i said i'm here to meet people maybe get some work, host some shows. She goes, well, sweetie, I have a show you can host. It's the Masters Mr. Olympia. You want to do that? Uh, what? That, that? Wait, that was your first offer? First show was the Jantana Classic Masters Mr. Olympia. And the next year, I was the onstage host for the Olympia. So I was the onstage host for the Olympia for the few years before Chicarillo took it over because Bob was still competing at the time. Tim. I understand that you've had a long career when it comes to being on stage, but to make the jump in this specific field from the Masters Olympia as your first gig to the Mr. Olympia, your second gig, how did that feel? Scary as hell. You kidding me? I bet. I, I, there's a whole <laughs> format bet. to uh, to orchestrating a show, and um, Jantana had a pro portion of the rest of her show as well with women's fitness, and uh, then they eventually figured Bikini hadn't come out yet. All the other divisions, ton of bodybuilding. Uh, I was in uh, Roanoke and Lynchburg, Virginia. And then this was the Vince T Taylor, Don Youngblood, John Natashak years, uh, Flavio Bacchanini. That show was stacked with amazing pros. And uh, I just figured it out, figured out how I, what I brought to the show, which I've always thought, in addition to uh, an announcer voice and a, and a good head for keeping it orchestrated, when there's a lull, I've usually got some kind of comedy locked and loaded that will keep the show going in a different way. And then uh, about a year later, I pushed and uh, Wayne D'Amelio, who was in charge of the uh, Olympia at the time, uh, gave me a shot. And this is uh, this is my 26th Olympia to be involved one way or another this year. 26th, incredible. What What is going to be your role this year? I am uh, leading the pay-per-view team. So I do the pay-per-view. I, I MC on stage the uh, Masters, uh, the Amateur Olympia. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, my feet get better after standing for 20 hours. And then Friday yeah. and Saturday night, it's uh, over the next couple of nights, it's myself, Phil Heath, and Sean Ray doing the pre-show. Uh, Sean was one of my idols as a kid, too. When when He's uh, about a year older, so when he was coming up, we, we were all such huge Sean Ray fans, so it's fun. Um, and then uh, Friday and Saturday nights, me and Phil, Sean, to, uh, to host and open the show, and then we have guests, Linda Murray. Uh, we have Mindy O'Brien, who does fitness and figure. Uh, Jennifer Dory, who said she's not going to compete in the yep. uh, bikini this year. So we're going to have her behind the mic for uh, bikini and possibly wellness. And then eight-time Miss Olympia, Linda Murray, does a women's bodybuilding and physique, women's physique. And uh, Oh, and I've got Terrence Ruffin, uh, who's an active top five uh, classic physique guy, is going to step behind the mic and do some classic physique. Fantastic. That's a that's a pretty diverse lineup. It's good that you guys are bringing in multiple people from multiple divisions in order to come in and give their two cents, because it's one thing for which is a great lineup to have you, you know, Phil Heat, uh, fantastic. But to be able to have people come in periodically to be able to give insight on the actual uh, uh, or sorry, the individual divisions really, really does make a difference for uh, for those of us watching at home, because that's been my experience is, of course, watching the Olympia from pay-per-view in order to cover it on my channel. So that certainly is very, very well appreciated. 20, 2019 was a learning experience. So uh, I hadn't done any commentating with Bikini as a division and wellness hadn't come around yet. 
And it was basically Sean Ray and I uh, in the announcer's booth 2019 going, all right, here comes another bikini girl. Looks like she's got great glutes. Next. Great glutes. Next. So so that uh, uh, that also <laughs> translates over at home. Trust me. I, when Dennis James was doing commentary with Fuad one year, it was um, – that no, that was for an Arnold Classic. It was saying that, that was those were the comments, right? Yeah, okay, I understand. But being able to have yeah that other presence, you know, in the booth certainly does keep it a little bit more of a uh, a well rounded conversation. And we I'm are sure. uh, static to have in our well rounded conversation. Uh, reigning Bikini Olympia champion Jennifer Dory. Uh, that is going to be just next level. So we're stoked about that. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you about some of the little nuances with Olympia TV, but even when it comes to the Olympia, how is it that, uh, or when do you guys start preparing for the commentary portion for the pay-per-view? Do you meet with Phil Heath and Sean Ray in advance? How many times do you guys meet? Do you guys decide what you're going to speak about in advance or do you guys kind of let it fly? Sean Ray seems like the kind of guy that would just let things fly. Um, Phil and I have a, a little advance notice and really cover what we're going to talk about days in advance maybe even a week or two we'll have a talk then another one and then well before the show that night or day we'll really cover what we're going to talk about you are correct about sean so sean um i call sean the vault that dude has his information locked and loaded back to 1964 and he's one of the rare we only had one of the guy that i think was this good and that was uh the late peter mcguff and sean will go you know uh that's when uh i'm Mohammed uh, Ben Aziza and uh, and then Samir Banu and he was wearing red trunks and uh, he had uh, he had gas that weekend and couldn't get his stomach flat but a Tums you know the the knowledge and obscure things he knows everything about every Olympia some rare USA some junior nationals who got their pro card where who fell off who rose up uh, controversies he's got it all at the ready and he's just he's in with a with an epic 60th Olympia with so much history backing it up. That's the dude I want in the middle between Phil and I to just come out with all these awesome facts. Regardless of what you may think of his uh, style when it comes to being a commentator, there is no questioning that he is an absolute wealth of knowledge. And he will tell you exactly what he thinks of competitors. He doesn't pull any punches, that's for sure. So Sean and Bob um, are Brussels sprouts. Some people can just eat them right out of the package. Some people have to have them tossed in uh, uh, brown sugar and bacon until they're caramelized. And some people go, don't even put that Brussels sprout on my plate. They're a very polarizing flavor, but they've earned it. They're both legends in the sport. Bob has spent more years now in behind the mic watching the best of the best than he did on stage as a top Olympian. Sean was at the top of the food chain. If there's ever two guys that deserve to talk any kind of opinion or trash or fact or fiction, it's those two guys. But I know they rub a lot of wrong people the wrong way. And uh, I, I just have a huge admiration for both of them. And just when the, when something outlandish happens, I just Google it and go, eh, they're right. It's offensive, but they're right. It's not uncommon for people to have that opinion as well. Like I said, you know, love them or hate them. Oftentimes, the opinion that they put out there is, you know, shooting straight from the hip. That's for sure. That's for sure. But no, it was uh, it was definitely interesting. Some of the questions I was able to ask Bob. But one of one of the things, like I said, I wanted to ask you about was Olympia TV, since we are coming up on the Olympia as well. Are you guys starting to prepare a little bit more for that? Uh, any interesting interviews coming up? Uh, maybe Dan Solomon, anybody like that? We just uh, taped our uh, Olympia Week interviews. Uh, and had some great guests and actually had a couple of the uh, top bikini competitors that we think are vying for the one and two spot this year with Jennifer Dory out. Um, we will be on about a one month hiatus and then ramping up post Olympia, which we love. Uh, be interesting who we get in after that. And then have you seen any of the Olympia battles? Oh, where yeah. they, oh so we're already planning. We These guys walk off stage with their Olympia medals and we're grabbing them going uh, June 15th, you August 12th and lining up the best of the best to get in there and duke it out on air. So that's the thing that we have to get well in advance so these guys can plan their lives around being there. Yeah, I remember the first Olympia battle. There was a lot of growing pains with that one, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, the, the second one was certainly much improved, certainly much improved. Yeah, doing a remote is has got its challenges for sure. Uh, but it is fun. And like the most recent one between uh, Sean Clarita and Keon Pearson, that was a blast. They went at it hard. 
uh oh, the yeah. one with um with Bumstead, Ramon, Urs, and uh, Vissers was phenomenal. Those guys were a blast. Yeah, uh, Samson, Nick, and Derek, that was another good one. Oh, that's a lot of meat right there. Those guys. Oh, yeah. Those are those are some big they, – they always break a machine. They break a machine every <laughs> single workout. I, I, I'm shocked that we haven't been kicked out of that gym. <laughs> Honestly, uh, uh, the three of them just – man, that was actually really good. Derek almost broke the internet with that hot mic, man. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> But this is part of the challenges, right? These are part of the challenges at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. Uh, the guys come pretty locked and loaded for a primetime muscle. We do a lot of research to bring the different uh, – the segments are written out in advance, and we do some decent research. And then my job, aside from orchestrating the intros and the outros, is being the ringleader between those two characters. And they uh, – the, Tarek starts breaking Chris's balls at 744 every morning before we get in the truck to go there. Uh, he's relentless. <laughs> he's oh, on the phone. Man. Where are you? We're leaving without you. And and Chris is seven forty five. Just oh man, I'm at the breakfast buffet. I'll be there in a minute. And they just they're hilarious. They are hilarious. So, so Chris is also based out out on the West Coast primarily. So he has to fly into Florida to film. That's where you guys film, right? We film actually in Phoenix at the uh, uh, Olympia headquarters. Oh, okay. So all of you guys have to travel. Well, and here's the hard part. So both those guys live in the San Diego area. Chris is San Diego-ish. Uh, Tarek is north of San Diego, about 45 minutes. But those guys, at any day, Chris is coming from Dubai. Tarek's coming from Thailand or India. They're always flying from all over the world. I will come from hosting one thing, leave there, and go to hosting another thing. And uh, I, I shot a movie last summer, and it was a month of filming. I did primetime muscle in the front. Went back, shot for two weeks, primetime muscle in the middle, went back and finished the two weeks of shooting. We're always on the go. So to be able to collect you guys in order to not only be in the same room, but also have a quality show such as Olympia TV probably can be quite a challenge sometimes. It is. And then uh, we we are happy to have uh, uh, Nico as our director and producer who works for uh, Jake who uh, pulls a lot of the graphics and creates all the cool imagery. And uh, and really, they built us a beautiful studio. And that's another thing we're, we're really grateful for. Uh, it's a beautiful studio. Um, Arizona is a challenge at times for about four months during the summer when uh, you don't deal with this up in Nova Scotia. Uh, they say, oh, but it's a dry heat. It's 118. My oven is a dry heat. I don't need to go there when it's 118. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. We don't deal with that up here, especially especially me being underwater most days. So, no, that's not something that we deal with, thankfully. When it comes to Olympia TV, where did that idea come from? Were you involved in the original idea of Olympia TV, or, or how did you end up getting involved? Uh, so Dan Solomon, I think, if there's anybody that goes back to the original you know, digital muscle and his previous iterations, he's the one to bring this whole commentating podcasty TV show to the forefront. Uh, and it, that was the, that was his inclusion. He was always that sports broadcaster, love of the sport guy. And uh, and he's the one that kind of kicked that off. And he and Sean did a show similar to this for years. And then Sean and Bob. And it's just kind of continued to evolve. And then when, when they put this together, uh, they know I'm the one that's been on TV and doing live TV off and on for 20 years. They said, We'll get you as the anchor and we'll build around you. And and the genius was thinking, all right, let's get a judge that knows the sport, the rules, the criteria, and an OG like Chris and a personality and uh, and just put it all together. And that was the fun. It really does work between you three. It's funny that you say that uh, Tarek and Chris are really bantering each other off camera too. I kind of, exp I, I, I had an inkling that was going to be the case, but I wasn't really sure. It's not just a show that they're putting on. These guys really do give each other shit. They give each other a ton of shit. But the funny <laughs> thing is, there's like an old Bugs Bunny cartoon where these two characters would fight when they're on the clock and then they're all best buddies when they clock out. There was a coyote and a and a wolfhound. And that's them. As soon as they clock off, they're hugs and wrestling and let's go to dinner, let's go to the gym. They're funny. Tim, Man, are they funny. Tim, I, I, I know what you're talking about. You assume that I didn't know. How, how old do you think I am? I watched uh, Bugs Bunny when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> was it? And it was definitely in color. Uh, I, yeah, I'm it wasn't. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't color. It wasn't have color. You, but have yeah, you made thirty yet, Kenton? Do you think I've made thirty yet? No. Thirty six, bud. 
Outstanding. Well, that's like uh, 28 yeah. Americans, so that's good. Uh, you know what? I, I partially blame it on the salt water, I guess. Uh, you know, keeps good skin. Yeah. Has a potential. Yeah. Some people pay for cold plunges. I get paid to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Congrats. <laughs> Hold up. Ah, well, we're getting there. We're getting there. But no, that's uh, that's something at Olympia TV really, really jumped up in the last couple of years. Channel sitting at about 340,000 subscribers at this point and has nowhere to go but up. Very, very beneficial channel for the athletes, for the fans. Uh, having, like I said, yourself, Tara, Chris, great commentary all around, really good production. It really is... It really is a standalone. From the first time that I saw Steve Weinberger on the show, I was like, this is really going to be something, man. And it was only within probably the last 18 months that it really even started. I think it was the, no, it would be longer than that. Olympia 2022 leading up to that, I think is when I first started really watching Olympia TV and I noticed it. Big Steve and Sandy were two of our most popular guests. And uh, I think so many of the competitors relate to them. They had such great knowledge. And Sandy had great stories about Chris, which people love. She ripped him to shreds. Uh, she was hilarious. Yeah. And she was, she's got amazing energy. So they were a blast. I appreciate you saying that. Um, what I get a lot of is people, especially at the Olympia, but I'll see somebody on a plane. And as soon as you see somebody's arms sticking out, you go, okay, that guy's a bodybuilder. And then he'll look up yeah. and realize it's me and go, dude, you're the guy from my cardio sessions. A lot of people watch us while we do while they do cardio. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you get that a lot. That's what podcasts have become is being able to watch that during cardio is is what gets you through, man. I was watching uh I was watching the latest bro chat this morning when I was doing cardio. We yeah, we like to keep our timing through. on our segments about cardio length. We think, all right, this, this guy's about eight weeks out. Let's cut this show to 30 minutes. Re really? It yeah. works. It works. It works perfectly. No. Oh. That is, it, it really is a fantastic channel. I, I encourage everybody to go over to the Olympia TV YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe. You, it really is direct from the source of the Olympia headquarters in order to get all the information that you're looking for as a bodybuilding fan leading up to the Olympia. So good to know that you've got some more content coming out. You guys just finished filming. I'll be, I'll be looking forward to that. That's for sure. Oh, that's oh, fantastic. We're really excited. Absolutely. <laughs> So aside from the Olympia TV, I, I wanted to go back to uh, some of your some of your comedy history here. Comedy is something that you've been doing longer than anything when it comes to being on stage. Is that right? 1990, I started. So this would this would be my 34th year, and uh, it, it's uh, it's been a great run. It's been a it's been an entry into a lot of other things that I didn't think I'd get to do, such as. Bodybuilding is a huge one. Uh, that's, that's uh, I had a morning, morning talk show uh, on the CBS affiliate in Tampa. Uh, movies. Uh, like Bob and I were in uh, the, the epic uh, bodybuilding movie, The Joe Weider Story, uh, uh, Bigger. Yep. And uh, yeah, thanks to, again, thanks to Dan Sullivan kind of taking that to the forefront and, and producing that one, uh, bringing that to life. Uh, that, uh, that was a phenomenal experience uh, to be on the show with uh, Tyler Hoechlin and Julianne Huff, who was amazing with a great director and then see something that well done. Yeah, I got a little piece of that. And being in comedy, working my way into bodybuilding and then having amazing friends that pick up the phone when cool projects happen. That, that, that kind of is how a lot of that happens. No, that is very cool. But your comedy has taken you even, even internationally. And it's actually quite a synergy where I saw that you actually did a comedy you, you did a comedy bit over in Afghanistan for, for the military. Is, is that right? We did uh, three weeks in Afghanistan, uh, basically going base to base by helicopter or by armored vehicle, uh, which was, that was 2005. I did a bunch of bases, 2003 to 2005, stateside, a couple other side, and a couple others in different countries. But Afghanistan was probably, that was the time I should have quit comedy because I knew it was never going to get any better than that. Uh, the feeling of entertaining the troops Go, knowing what they're going through, going to them and being a part and giving them two hours with the other comedians I was with to just forget everything and shut down and laugh was the greatest experience ever. Makes a big difference, I would imagine, especially during that time over there. What what year was that you were there? Two thousand June, July of 2005. Yeah, and um, okay. quick, quick, cool stories. We did the first night in um, 
uh, Kyrgyzstan in Manas Air Force Base in Kyrgyzstan. And, and we had about 200 people, a couple of Marines come up to us uh, at the end of the show and say, hey, uh, we're sleeping in a tent that night. And uh, a, uh, a couple of Marines come up and say, hey, too bad you guys aren't going to be here tomorrow night. We have like another 50 Marines that have really been through some tough stuff and uh, they could really use a show. Well, the next morning, the guy that was in charge of getting us where we needed to go in Afghanistan comes in, kicks open our tent, goes, hey, fellas, I got bad news for you. You can't get at, you can't get downrange to that other part of Afghanistan. Uh, you got to stay another night. We said, great, Sarge, let's do a show. So we did another show for them and the people on guard duty. And those two Marines came up to us again and said, too bad you guys are going to be here tomorrow night. There's 400 Marines that have been going cave to cave oh, looking for the Taliban and bad guys. They've lost a lot of friends. They could use a show. And sure enough, Sarge walks in, takes off his hat. It's Groundhog Day. Sorry, fellas, can't get you downrange. You know, bullets and, and beans are more important. So we said, we're doing a show, Sarge. And they couldn't bus up those 400 Marines to, the, to our base. So we went to the old Russian airplane hangar where they were sleeping my buddy had a a, a marine gunnery sergeant uh, back a, a loader off the flight line, the ones that load the big cargo planes. That was our stage. We hooked up a couple of speakers, and all 400 of those marines turned their uh, cots into a little amphitheater. And as each comedian is going up and coming down and introducing each other, they look at the rest of us and go, guys, it's magic up there. It's never going to get any better. And I was the last guy, and the comedian who's a really great friend of mine, Derek, gets up to do the intro he goes, all right, you may have seen him on MTV or on uh, Comics on the Road. Uh, he was a Marine from 86 to 90, and all 400 guys came up out of their seats and did this little bark that we all do. Arr! And uh, I looked, and I had chills from head to toe, and I did my 20 minutes, and I said, guys, thank you more than you know. And I popped a nice little crispy salute. All 400 came up again, and I look over, and my other four comedian buddies are crying. I look back. I'm crying. I said, I should quit. It's never going to get any better than this. That really is quite a story, man. That's that's quite a story. I I can I can understand where you're coming from. Saying, you know what? Call it. I've I've felt like that uh, doing jobs up in the Arctic when I was doing uh, doing dive jobs up there. I was like, I mean, this is it. Like, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the, when's it going to get better than this? No, I, I understand. As soon as my balls do. come up, as soon as my balls come back up out of my body, I'm going to quit diving. That's great. <laughs> I was quite warm, man. I was quite warm. So work. yeah, and one other super quick story is we're going downrange to a, a city called Kalalabad, and we're in three uh, a, a cargo helicopter followed by uh, two uh, attack helicopters, and they're about to land, and they land really funny, and all of a sudden they take back off, and they all start firing, and just guns and bullets and stuff going off. The guy in the back of our plane is kang, kang, with the machine guns, and we get out of the line of fire and land. And we noticed that the girl next to the, the, the person next to the machine gun had a ponytail. And either it was a girl or Billy Ray Cyrus joined the Air Force. We don't know. Uh, but it turned out it was be a girl. She's got this big black helmet, and this big black Darth Vader mask. And you got five comedians holding each other, trying not to cry and pee themselves while this is going off. And she pops that mask up and she goes, are you guys OK? And you never <laughs> feel like a bigger puss. Than having a girl named Rachel with an M50 machine gun or a 50 caliber machine gun asking you if you're okay. <clears throat> yeah, we're we're good. We're good, Rachel. We're good. <laughs> yeah, whether you like it or not, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. No, that is really cool, man. No, that's quite the experience. That those are the kind of things where all your experience all tying together, being in the Marines and then doing comedy and then being able to come back to that to be able to draw on that previous experience. Very, very cool. It's very cool. It's uh, and the military thing I draw on for everything, but especially for bodybuilding, the discipline of everything that we've gone through. You think, okay, I've eaten these horrible meals, these the, the MREs. I don't know what they have in the uh, Canadian military, but ours are called MREs. They tell us that means meals ready to eat. But back in the 80s, meant meals refused by Ethiopians. Uh, we were on a relief mission throwing them off and they're throwing them back on the trucks. No, no, no. Keep these. We'll eat dirt. Um, they're horrible, but if you can eat those in the field, eating uh, tilapia and brown rice looks really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I've tried a, an MRE one time, one time. And I think it was like a, a chicken and rice type thing, but it was, I, I don't know. The chicken was a little pasty. The rice was not actually, the rice was not bad, but I don't, I don't know, man. I could see that getting old pretty quick. 
It, it, it got old, but chicken and rice was one of the better ones. Oh, well, looks like I lucked out. <laughs> you did luck out. <laughs> Shit. Oh, that's funny, man. Yeah, the uh, the Marines thing. So what made you want to go and, and become a Marine to begin with? Probably the same reason I wanted to be a bodybuilder when I was 15, too. I just I was a little kid that got picked on a lot. Uh, I wanted I wanted a sense of belonging. I wanted that esprit de corps. I loved the military growing up. Um, but I thought at that point, if I was going to overcome every fear I've ever had, I was all going to do it at once. And instead of joining the Army, the Air Force or the Navy, I thought, well, if there's going to be a boot in my ass, let it be the biggest, darkest, well shined boot you can manage. And and that was the Marines. And it was a great call because it, it it changed who I was for the rest of my life. No, I understand the challenge. I do. Uh, when I decided to go to uh, the police academy to study corrections at 23 years old, everybody around me really did not understand it, you know, especially given the the place that I was at where I was working for my dad and I was kind of a shoe in to be able to take over the diving company. And I was I'm really just looking to get out there and really just challenge myself. Like I'm, I'm looking to do something way outside of what I would do my, for my comfort zone and something that's just, man, just something that can really say that I sunk my teeth into, you know, this is something that not everybody does every day. I, I get it, you know, and yeah, they kicked my ass at the Academy, you know, they kicked my, but that's what I was looking for. That's exactly what I wanted. It's exactly what I wanted. And it, it was everything I could have hoped. And then it's uh, something that once you've earned it, it stays with you for the rest of your life. And it, there's so many stories that go with that. But yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. Oh, yeah. I actually, I graduated uh, best all around cadet for my squad that year. So I, I'll have that for it. Like I've got the plaque on my wall in my office. I'll, I'll have it forever, you know. Now, I was uh, I was going to give you trash, but I, I decided after I watched. Uh, so you think you, you mentioned with uh, the interview with Bob Ciccarillo that you'd done corrections. And Bob was a cop yeah. for a short period of time. And uh, I, I always think, you know, how tough is it in Canada? Then I remember Bad Blood with Kim Coates. I watched all three seasons with that. You've got mafia up there. You've got gang members. It's not all Bob and Doug McKenzie and, and Bare Naked Ladies. you got some trouble. Oh, Tim, I can tell you, even from the short time that I was, the, the first week that I was working in the institution, just in my orientation before they'd even let you, you know, do do rounds in the unit as an individual guard, there was a bomb threat the first day. So everybody was locked down. They had to bring in the bomb squad from uh, from another town in order to clear the facility beforehand. Yeah. The first week that I was actually able to work on my own, though, they brought in a Hells Angels guy that ended up shooting someone point blank in the face. Nice. And of course, that was... And that was my unit. Two. I remember it like yesterday, unit two. I had to go down to work. And they were like, just so you know, they just brought this guy in. This way. I was like, okay. Started doing my rounds. And buddy was like, buddy said, yeah, how's it going? I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, oh, you sound like a Newfoundlander. And I was like, no, no, Cape Breton, but pretty close. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we've been through there. We were looking at setting up chapters down there at one point. And I was like, this fucking guy just shot someone point blank. He's <laughs> This is very casual conversation for someone like this. And I was like, I guess this is going to be the go while I work, while I do this, you know, I was like, okay, hey, this is where and we're there's, a, there's a thing you respect them. They respect you. You know, you didn't oh, yeah. know any, some guy shoots him in the face. The next day he's talking to you about poutine recipes. Hey, what do you think of Timmy's coffee? You know, it's, I don't get it either. It, there's a dynamic there that is slightly inexplainable, but accepted is the best that were I can see when it comes to that. Were, were you pretty yoked when you were on the job? Oh man, I was savage, man. I was like, I tra like I train hard now. Don't get me wrong, but back then, man, I was fucking sad. I remember I, another good story. They had a gym in in the uh, in the unit. There's actually this is twofold. I actually um, was working in another unit, and there was one guy that had to go train separately because he couldn't train with everyone else in the unit because he was that much of a security risk, right? So they said Jer they they came to me. I said, Jardine, take this guy down to the gym for forty five minutes. Here's a radio. I was like, okay, took him down. And the guy told me what he did. And I, I don't even know if I want to say, I, I don't even know if I want to say it. <laughs> Man, I was just like, is this time almost up? Like, holy shit. Like the, that, one, that was one. But um, I actually, I would train there at night, like on night shift, like I'd take any shift I could. So I worked a night shift one night and the gym was like central in the jail but you could play music in there too. So you use CDs back in uh, 2013, primarily when I was there, right? So I popped a CD in there and I just started cranking the tunes at two in the morning, smashing weights. My guard, my guard captain comes in. He's like, 
what the hell are you doing? I was like, I'm fucking training, man. He's like, you're waking up two units in here, man. What are you doing? I was like, shit, sorry, man. He was like, don't fucking do that again. <laughs> like, I was, man. Like, and that's one thing where Bob was uh, like, it was obviously wasn't to this extreme, but Bob mentioned in the interview, he said, there's, you know, one difference between you and the inmates. And that's, you know, you get to go home at night. Well, it's not quite that extreme. It's not far off necessarily, but yeah, put, get, having yourself in that environment, you can probably attest to it, you know, being in the Marines and being around certain, like you just, you adapt to certain things when you were around that environment for so long. Right. And I was just, man, I was like from the, from when I started the Academy and then starting to work, I was savage, man. Like I was just ready to fucking go. Your brain goes native real quick. It exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, exactly what it is. Yeah, because yet you have to adapt when you're in those situations. You know, if you don't adapt to certain mindset, it's going to be a long hard road. Hey, the nice white kid with the sweet face is going to get shanked if he doesn't get hard fast. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Interesting experiences. That's for sure. But aside from all that, um, I, I wanted to ask you about the current crop of olympia competitors as well yes my dog is here for everybody looking yes good girl <laughs> the joys but um who do you like this year going into the olympia in the open class we've got some very very interesting competitors coming up here that have made substantial improvement in the last year I don't know which way it's necessarily going to go yet. You look at Samson with the improvements that he's made. Nick is not showing anybody anything right now. Derek's back somehow became even bigger than what it was last year. Hottie looks at... Who, who do you like this year, Tim? What way do you see it going? Well, one through five is a bit of a war to begin with. And five through nine is a disaster to try to pick. Um, oh, man. I, now, Samson, here's one of the things that I have a hard time with because I know how hard it is for a guy like Samson's size to look huge standing next to – I've always equated it 10 pounds per inch of height. So if you say, all right, Derek's 5'8", and Samson's six foot six one, he's got to be 40, 50 pounds heavier to look yeah. as huge. And so Samson has a task, and Samson's big task, as you just said – uh, he just posted a picture the other day where he's really well conditioned for four weeks out. And that's been his problem is that last little bit of conditioning. Um, he switched uh, trainers. He's got his wife doing a lot of the diet and a lot of the training. Uh, but a lot of it for Samson and talking with him was the mental aspect and the stress going into competition and having his uh, his amazing wife, uh, Marlenka, doing, uh, I, I'm hoping I said that correctly, doing things. He's taking that stress off that's keeping him from spilling over and getting that little bit of uh, that little layer under his skin. If he comes in with fibers, he's going to look massive. Did you see that picture of him coming out of the barn with his back shot? They 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 I call think, him I, barn I, door lats. He had barn doors. Man, I saw the picture that he put up with a side tricep there yesterday. Unbelievable. He really does look like he's gaining the conditioning that everybody is finally waiting for him to bring to that Olympia stage. That tricep was grainy. That shoulder, that quad, everything was grainy. If he can bring that to the Olympia stage, he's going to be very, very much more dangerous than he was in previous years. And he's training extremely hard right now. That's actually a video that I uh, that I was considering working on who's training the hardest for the Olympia right now? Because I think that's a telltale thing when you're getting into this point uh, out from the Olympia being about four weeks out or so. Samson is training so hard that he will have to fall to the floor after doing drop sets on legs just to recover. Like, he's he's training really hard, man. Well, uh, you've got to watch that, though, because we saw that with, uh, with Nick. And Nick Walker said he wasn't training that hard last year when he popped that hamstring. Um, so you do get to the point where you're depleted, your carbs are lower, your electrolytes are a little off, your everything starts to get a little off the closer you get because of the deprivation. Uh, so you got to be a little careful, but I admire how hard he trains. Derek, he didn't need to win. He didn't need to grow his back to win. He needed a little more depth in his upper chest uh, and a little more uh, a little more conditioning upper and mid chest for that side chest when you bring it across. We'll see if he did that. He hasn't shown a ton of that just yet in the updates. Uh, there was that one picture of him walking away in the gym that his wife snapped. I think it was his wife that just grabbed it and said, I got to get this on tape. That was massive. 
unbelievable. His, uh, I didn't think it was even possible for Derek to gain a wider back. I mean, I feel like it actually hunches his arms forward more. His back is so wide when he gets a pump. It's unbelievable. One of the best backs to ever hit a back double on the bodybuilding stage, hands down. No question. Ever. So I, I think the guy who's going to have trouble in the mix between the two of those is Hottie. Um, it, it's going to be really hard to improve. And they say they judge what's on stage at that moment. And I admire that. But there is a little bit of a mindset of, okay, who's doing the homework that we told him to do? You know, when Hottie, when these guys come off and they get their feedback and his he and his crew say, why were we second this year? Why that guy? And they point out the three poses he lost. If he goes back to the drawing board and knocks that out, they have to honor that and say, okay, but did Derek continue to improve past that? Now, you got the Samson effect. Did he come in more conditioned where he jumps over Hottie? That that three man, when Big Steve pulled the three of those guys out last year for the uh, pose down and was doing the quarter turns and switching it, Derek in the middle, now Hottie, Samson in the middle, Derek switched places with Hottie and back and forth. He worked those guys. And I think oh, yeah. if if uh, Samson was a little more conditioned, that would have been a – he's going to take a pose from each of them this year. So what do you think Hadi does need to improve in order to come in and reclaim that title? Keep in mind, everybody, that if Hadi does take back the Olympia title this year, he will be the only competitor to ever win back the Olympia title since Jay Cutler did it in 2009. Oh, wow. That's something to think about. Uh, he'll be, the, he'll be the only one in bodybuilding history to lose the title and come back and win it the year later. I'm sure Jay will be somewhere going, I can't believe Ronnie, Jay, Chris, nobody took that away from me. I, I, and then he comes along and I take it back. That's crazy. Um, that's uh, he, he would be very impressive. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what he does with his low to mid back and what kind of condition he brings to that. Um, it is inside chest that that shredded sus that's <laughs> it's just brutal. And that the hang of the hamstring on Hottie that didn't need to come up where he's going to come up with a lot of these guys uh, say bigger, 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 their waists expand. So we'll see how much he improved without expanding his waist. That's fair to say, too. Yeah, because a lot of people think that Hottie at this point is maxed out to the point where if he puts on any more size that it is going to affect his waistline. So it will be interesting to see what he does bring to the stage this year. What we can say is right now, he is looking phenomenal. He's in the United States early. He's preparing with Hani Rambod now. And he's definitely going to be a force. He wants it back. He wants it back bad. Okay, now here's where you and I need to, to hash this out. Fourth, fifth, and sixth. Oh, man. Fourth, fifth, and sixth is 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 a serious problem. Okay, so one of the guys that we need to talk about before we get into fourth, fifth, and sixth is the impact of Andrew Jack based on what we saw at the Texas Pro. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And how he could very, uh, I don't want to say easily because it's going to be a very tough lineup, but he could easily be considered as a top three competitor at this year's Olympia. Oh. He took fifth last year. He's massively improved. And I, as of right now, do have Andrew Jacked in my top three. Okay. Uh, well, so we'll have to circle back to that then. One of my favorite days, if you're watching at home or if you're there, one of my favorite days is Thursday, the press conference. And everybody goes, oh, yes. press conference, the same old crap, blah, blah, blah. A couple of years ago, when Andrew Jack comes out, it was there was just a gasp. And then when Michael Creaso came out, took his shirt off, there was yep. I love those moments. But Andrew Jacked, Andrew Jacked has something the others still don't have. And he was near 300 pounds at the Texas Pro, which is a yep. huge improvement and condition. His lines, his waist, his top to bottom ratio, everything was just stunning. So if you've got him top three, you got him third. Who did you bump? Yeah. So that's where fourth, fifth, and sixth becomes very difficult. Very difficult. But we can get a better idea of it now, especially after seeing Hunter Labrada just compete at uh, the uh, the Italy show. Fourth, fifth, and sixth. As of right now, I'm going with Hunter, Sampson, and Nick in fourth, fifth, and sixth. Now, when it comes to what order I have those three in, I do have Hunter in sixth as of right now, and I do have Sampson and Nick battling it out for fourth, 
and fifth. The problem with Nick Walker is that we haven't seen anything, nothing. We don't know what Nick is going to look like. We have no idea. Now, what can we base it on? The New York Pro? Sure. Based on his New York Pro look and what I'm seeing right now from Samson, Samson should beat him. Samson yeah. should beat him. So I'm leaning toward that now. And I look for all my other for all for all my my buddies that are, where I've been on the podcast, Dylan and Mark and, and Xavier and everybody else. We said that we were going to be changing up predictions, boys. So this is what I'm doing. Okay, it's not the Olympia yet. So, but anyway, <laughs> every, everybody goes through this. Dennis James changes predictions every week. It doesn't matter. But like you said, though, we don't know. And this is the beautiful part. I see some guys that I have a huge admiration for posting their stuff four weeks out. And RX Muscle or Generation Iron says, this is this guy four weeks out. And I go, has he not started his diet yet? Because some of these guys have such a magic, such a last minute magic. And other guys are shredded and coming in for a soft landing. And I know almost exactly how they're going to look. So I don't know. Now, Nick, Nick is a different beast. Uh, when he posted those pictures getting ready last year and he was in that beautiful light, his waist was so tiny. So oh, you tiny. mean those shots at, at a week out? Was is yes. that the one? Insane. Yeah. Everybody thought that he would have been <laughs> easily in contention for the title based on that look. A lot a lot of people did think that Nick could have come in and taken it, given Top how great. hot he looked I- and how Derek looked. Go oh, top three, yeah. Top three. Um, so I, I have to go back when we think, all right, if you're thinking top three and Andrew Jacked is up there, then you bumped Samson out. So that was that was the wild card there. So you've got him duking it out against Derek and Hottie. Okay. I do. I can see that. Um, I do. Now that's going to come down to his conditioning. Now Nick, Nick conditions. You see, remember him at the Arnold Classics. He comes in and he's the vein chart for a young group of doctors that are in training. It's just vain. Oh, yeah everywhere but he's another one nick loves size nick trains hard he eats well year round he doesn't have those big 50 60 pound swings um and and i i learned this when we were at the dinner uh, with jake wood and the team and uh i'm eight weeks out from my first show and i'm eating a steak and nick is eating out of tupperware at a really nice steakhouse you rube what are you what's wrong with you bro you can eat off the menu eight weeks out good for you not me you're six months away. I got this, bro. So yeah, he wants to be Mr. Olympia. It doesn't matter. He wants to be Mr. Olympia. I love that, man. I I love that. I love that. So then we're talking Hunter. uh, And who do you, who else do you have in that top six? Uh, Samson, Nick and Hunter. Here's, here's a mistake we make. A lot of us make, we forget Brandon Curry. Yes, we do. Everybody forgets Brandon Curry. We forget uh, uh, the giant, uh, not the giant killer. Um, we forget, uh, see, I've forgotten already. He just qualified six weeks ago. Uh, one of the perennial favorites for the last 10 years. The name will come to me in a minute. Um, th- there's that. There, you've got um, Beirut Tabani this year. You've got Martin Fitzwater. You've got some guys. The top 10, the battle to be in that top 10 is going to be deeper than I think it's ever been before. Do you, do you think Beirut is going to make it? Because he still doesn't have his visa. A lot of people are leaving him out of their predictions altogether because he doesn't have his visa yet. You know, and this is one of those American things that pisses me off to no end. And a lot of Americans just say they should just come with their trainers and sneak across the southern border. There is no yeah. reason to keep a bodybuilder out of the United States. They're here for work. Give him his visa and let him come here and get on stage in Vegas. Yeah, you know, he even tried to go through an Iranian-based uh, manufacturing company. I did a story on it in order to try and get what I thought was a sponsorship for a visa through a company that does an amount of international business. It doesn't seem like it's actually worked at this point. But uh, yeah, he sat down with a, a group of probably like 30 or 40 people at a table and said, look, I will be Mr. Olympia. And this company, they do like manufacturing of everything from like, you know, drilling fluids to dyes for soaps, from what I understand. Like, they're, they're, they're quite a diverse company that operates, like I said, internationally. It doesn't seem like it's worked as of yet. After three years, I would have hoped that they would have found some way for him to be here. He's won two pro shows this year. He would be easily a shoe win for the top 10. Top eight, I would say. It's a yeah. travesty. It's, it's a travesty to bodybuilding. 
it's an absolute travesty to the sport and it's a disgusting facet of American visa culture. I don't even know what to call it. The fact that you're keeping a guy out that's here to do that. And, and it is an international sport. It's like saying you can't come in and you're part of the Olympics. This is, it's the international federation of bodybuilders. Do you think that that speaks to the maybe infancy of the sport of bodybuilding in particular or areas that uh, the, 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 the IFBB could make improvements? No, it speaks to uh, idiot bureaucracy. Uh, the IFBB okay. can beg and write letters and and say, hey, we're, it's a huge part of every culture. India, China, we're getting more bodybuilders from Brazil than ever before. And, and by bodybuilders, I mean across all divisions. And the fact that there's anybody in any country. It, okay, what are you going to tell me? That Beirut's to Bonnie is a terrorist and we got to keep him out? If he's a shoe bomber at 275 pounds, he can't reach his feet. How's he going to light a bomb on his shoe when the man can't strap it to his back? He can't touch his back. Trust me. He's going to be okay. When you think about it like that, yeah, that's uh, probably not something you're going to argue to, uh, you know, the U S embassy over there in Iran, but uh, you know, (laughs) look, the fact of the matter is the guy should be here, but I I'm leaving him out of my predictions as of right now. And and most people are very, very unfortunate because he'd shake up yeah. that top 10 for sure. He'd be, ta- he'd be taking a spot away from somebody, you know? So Rami, uh, we, we've got another Olympia up there. Uh, Brandon, I can't believe this name is still eluding me, but he's one of the uh, perennials from the last, from like 2017 to 21. Here's a guy that has been at the top. Akeem Williams. Three. No, Akeem Williams. There's another one. If Akeem yeah. Williams yeah. comes in diced, he is massive. We never know what Akeem Williams is going to show up, but if he comes in, if he finally nails his conditioning at the Olympia, he's going to be a trouble spot for that top five to 10 spot. Yeah, he definitely is. He's, he's a wild card. There's no question there, but after what we saw at the two Arnold classics, I think Chris Aceto really is starting to figure out how to dial this guy in. So going to be very interesting with him too. This is just it. There's a there's a lot of variables for that top ten right now. I mean, it's Martin Fitzwater's first year. How is he going to do based on what we just saw from Detroit and and New York, where he really pushed Nick Walker? A lot of people are saying that Martin could push for that sixth place spot in front of Hunter Labrada. First Olympia. It, it would be interesting because he comes in condition. Another guy who comes in really conditioned, who I have a huge respect for, is John Jewett. Uh, yep. John knows his physique, and he's put on so much quality weight. He was a uh, a 212 guy at the Linda Murray uh, Classic that I was emceeing in the Linda Murray Pro, the Atlanta Pro, two years ago. And I said, there's no way. He's got that no division can hold me physique that, you know, if you're classic, you know you're not going to be classic next year. If you're 212, you know you're going to be open next year, a problem we all wish we had. You know, yeah. oh, next year I won't be physique anymore because I'm going to get so jacked I'll have to go classic. Um <laughs> He he's just a guy though that nails his conditioning, so he's going to be interesting to see how good he looks. Yeah, and how he compares in a lineup is the other thing. You know, he's put on some size. What else does he really need to do? Has he put on enough to push for that top ten? You know, that's going to be that's going to be really interesting to see. Okay, you you bring up a really interesting point there, and and I love this. This is one of the tough things about the sport as both a competitor and MC, all three, a competitor and MC, and a mega fan. You've got a guy from a country somewhere that qualifies that beat 10 other guys to get to the Olympia, okay? You're top of the food chain in a region, at a show. You're somebody. And you get on stage with the best of the best of the best, and you go, there's the chubby kid in the corner. You know, it, it's just amazing how um, how remarkable you have to look to win a show, to qualify for the Super Bowl of our sport. And yet the quality at the top is so amazing that some guys at the bottom can get lost. And that's got to be really, that would fire me up. I would be a beast the next year by no, but to be in that tied for 16th spot into the infinity would be brutal knowing you are so good and truly one of the best in the world, but there's such a bottleneck to that next level. 10 to 5, 5 to 1. And like you were saying, that 10 to that 10 to 5 especially is going to be it's so up in the air, not just because of who's coming in, but who's out. Like I said, Beirut is one. Tony O'Burton announced that he is not doing the Olympia. Dude. Tony O's out. Yeah, he's out. I, I saw that and I couldn't believe it. When you're four weeks out, I said no. Uh, a couple people said, hey, great call. 
Uh, you know, you got to do what's right for you. You got to put on more size. But there's so many factors as far as I'm concerned, getting on stage, familiarity, the fans, or just getting up there and saying, all right, this is how my body reacts to the big show. Because there's a certain amount of cortisol with I traveled, I spilled, I did this, I did that. To get ready for Olympia prep, you can say next year, all right, the Olympia jitters are gone. Now I'm going to get a little better next year and a little better the year after and go 10, 6, 5, 2, 1. Or Ronnie Coleman, 9, 1. Um, you you got to get up there and do the process. And when you're this close, it's what, four weeks, call it 16. It's about 18 cardios and a couple of chicken breasts and you're on stage. Get up there, dude. Well, you know, Tonio is not inexperienced on the Olympia stage. He he did the 212 Olympia at, at least once, if not twice, I believe. And, and he finished, he did the open um, where he finished outside of the top 10, his first one. He placed top eight last year. So when it comes yeah. to, I mean, when it comes to the Olympia jitters, I think he's probably okay there. He's a pretty experienced competitor at this point. One of the things though, is that working where it could have benefited him further to your point would have been, working directly with Justin Jacoby, who's his coach now. They've done a few shows together, but they haven't done the big one. Yeah. You know? So that could have been a benefit. Absolutely. I think that they could have announced it earlier as well, in my opinion. You know, to wait till four weeks out, eh, you know, people were starting to ask the questions. Like, I was starting to get messages about Tony. What do you think about Tony? And, and I, I kind of had an inkling that he wasn't going to be doing it. And it's like, you think he's going to be doing it? He doesn't look very good right now. And I kind of pushed it off and pushed it off. And then finally he came up with the announcement. So yeah. Uh, do I think it's going to serve him well in the future? Yeah, sure. But for this year's Olympia, it, it again, changes things. Yeah. You know, you got the spots this year opened up by uh, Ian Valier and Antoine Valiant not being in the show. Um, yeah. Charles and- Griffin. He finished top 10 last year. He's not doing it. Charles There's Griffin is one. out. Uh, so there's a lot of jockeying to be done and a lot of just really even when you think about it, evenly conditioned, evenly sized, evenly shaped physiques that are going to be duking it out for those spots. That's what's going to be really fun. It, it it really is. It really is. So with that being said, what's your top six? Uh, I, I've got Derek uh, regaining the title because it is okay. really you have you have to knock the champ out. Uh, depending on conditioning, uh, Samson and Hottie going at it for second, third. I've got Andrew, uh, Andrew third or fourth, depending on that jock. I'm going to go with you on that jockey right there. And then, uh, fifth, sixth, you do have, uh, you've got Hunter and, uh, that's that, that next spot is the tough one. Cause it's got about five guys. I think that could take it. You don't think it's going to be Nick in that top six minimum. Oh, oh, absolutely. You're right. Uh, no, Nick. Mm, yeah. Nick, Nick will probably be, that's going to be interesting because Hunter's going to come in at about 285, 290. Um, and that Milan pro Italy pro conditioning was probably his best ever. I, like I said, I I've emceed the Labrata classic for the last, uh, uh, five to seven years. And, uh, I'm not, it, it's not a money thing. I'm sure Lee could afford any guest poser he wants, but he's always got Hunter. Uh, and I get to get yeah. first look to see how much size he's put on. Uh, I got to train in the gym with Hunter and Roy Evans. And uh, I didn't train with them. I was next to them while they were training. Uh, and and he was slinging some weight and then took his shirt off after. The, w- the waist is dialed in. The waist is, for the gains that he's made, it's impressive. So okay. I, Hunter and Nick, yeah, they're, they're duking it out for that uh, – for that five, six spot. No. Okay. Okay. No, as of, as of right now, I've got Hottie actually taking back the title. Okay. I think that, I think Hottie is on an absolute war path right now. I think that he's just built different than all these other guys. There's something about when you watch him train, when you watch him hit these poses, he's here super early. Something is telling me, that he really took it to another level this year, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> so as of, as of right now, as impressive as Derek is and as, as impressive as Hottie in it, right now I've got Hottie taking it home. Second, I, I do I do have Derek in uh, in second. Andrew Jack, I have third. And like I said, if if you were going to really push me on it, I would I would put Samson in fourth, Nick in fifth, and Hunter in sixth. That's that's where I'd have it right now. That's reasonable. Now yeah, here's that's, the bigger that's struggle. 
You're talking open. Are you a uh, a classic fan? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you've seen recent pictures of Seabum. I have. That's not going anywhere. But <laughs> no. That top five now, I I don't think it's a Seabum Ramon show this year. Neither do I. Neither do I just got major, major shit in the comment section for uh, my buddy Krishan has a channel called Goat Fitness. And I actually put in there, Ramon Dino will be fourth place this year. And thank you. You know what? Thank you, Tim. Thank you. I'm I'm really glad I had you on. (laughs) I I have to sit next to a Brazilian. I have to sit next to Tarek who bitches me out in Portuguese when I say this. Uh, You're about to get dinosaurs on your Instagram. And they can hate me all they want with their dinosaurs and and their their Portuguese. Uh, yell at me in Spanish, English, or Italian. I speak those languages. I think it's Seabum followed by Wesley Vissers. Yes. Yes. I think we've got possibly, if it's not Urs, Mike Sommerfeld. Really? Dude, he looks massive. Okay. He I haven't seen anything massive. recent from Mike. Now, now Mike Sommerfeld caught my eye at the 2022 Olympia when he took, I think he took fifth at that, at that he show. Did. Yeah, he he caught my eye then, and his shape impressed the hell out of me. He is so shapely. for He was built for classic physique. Absolutely. He's got to nail that condition. I hope he can make weight because he looks open. Yeah, yeah, he does, man. But he isn't. He really, he really is built for classic. If he can, he can make that weight and bring that conditioning. I'm gonna have to go back and look at that again now. You got to look wow. at the update he just posted. Uh, look at Matt Grego, and we always forget Breon. Breon, when he won Dubai a few weeks ago, showed the best Breon ever. And Chris yep. can't say anything on the show on uh, on uh, Primetime Muscle because he, Breon's in Camp Cormier. Uh, but Chris Breon, is going to say he's winning the show. Every time, every <laughs> time, and I'll take that money. I'll take a pair of his size 14 Gucci shoes as payment for that. Uh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, look, that's his prerogative. We understand that, but no, Breon I'll is put, someone I'll that you're Breon top right. five, top five all day. Okay, okay. So if you got Breon top five, then I'm I'm in agreement with you, Chris, and then Wesley. Wesley is so massively improved, he has finally come into his own. And frankly, he's finally getting the recognition for being just that good for classic. We talked about being built for classic with Mike Sommerfeld. Wesley is that, and then some. He is the definition of the golden era physique in the modern age of bodybuilding. Many, many people out there that are fans of bodybuilding agree that Wesley Vissers should be the standard for classic physique, and many believe that once Chris Bumstead has stopped competing, that Wesley will be the new standard, and he will be for a significant period of time. I ha- I absolutely agree. Now I now that we brought up uh, Breon, now I'll put him battling it out with Ramon for that that spot, um, and maybe not Summerfeld, but it's going to jockey right around in there. Um, I do have Wesley. I do have Wesley being the heir apparent, and uh, and it drives Tarek crazy. Um, I, I have Wesley <laughs> being the guy that. I think this may be Chris's last year. I'm not going to say anything. I Don't tell anybody I said that. I think this may be his last year. He's so bloody smart with business. Guys need to understand, and this is a new era. You don't get the $200,000 weeder contract anymore. Supplement companies aren't throwing money around. You've got to make your, your investment in you, knowing that your time frame on stage is limited, he has done a brilliant job with that, and I think it'll carry him through another 20 years, and he's got to say, how much time do I want to spend away from the wife, the new baby, life, and how much better is my time going to be served while I'm this young, developing my brand forever? And I think he's got to be a year or two away from that tops. Uh, he's now part owner of Gymshark as well. He's he's done. He's the He doesn't have to go chasing down contracts. He's given the contracts out. Very, very smart. That's the thing yeah, right there. Indeed. I'm actually of the opinion that Chris will not retire this year. I think that Chris, I I think he'll continue to compete as long as he still has his health markers in check and he can still come in and absolutely dominate because as much as Chris, you're right. He has a, he has a new family. He has many business ventures. 
bodybuilding is part of that business venture. He probably makes ridiculous amounts of money. Not probably. It's a certainty. He makes ridiculous amounts of money just by coming in and doing the Olympia. That builds every single brand. Now, what, what else that Chris is involved in can build every single brand that he is associated with? His Olympia check probably, the pays the, uh, probably pays the taxes on everything else. Uh, well, actually, no, it probably wouldn't given the tax. It probably doesn't. You're right. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not. But, yes. but it is the one thing from a business perspective, competing at the Olympia and dominating as he does can build every single brand that he has. So after just taking over Gymshark, the timing of it is absolutely genius. You're four weeks from the Olympia, and now you have this massive brand that you've just become a part owner of. You're about to come in and win your sixth title. So that's for this year. But I think that Chris, as smart as he is, he is still a competitor, and I don't think that he's quite done yet. I think he has another two in him. I think I think you're right, and I think one of the things that proved that was last year with some of the injuries he had, he couldn't even go at it as hard as he did, and it's so yeah. ingrained in who he is. It was just a matter of turn it up, get on stage, turn it back off, and that's all it took to regain and hold that title. Um, I don't yeah. think he'll be able to do that forever, but I, I think you're right. He's got another year or two in him. Oh, de- most definitely, and he's a competitor. I just think that he'll inherently want to keep going, and you don't really hear about the retirement talk from Chris unless he's asked the question. He doesn't bring it up. The things that he does bring up is things like his self-confidence issues that he's had in the past. Okay, well, everybody struggles with that. Even Nick Walker probably struggles with that at times, you know, and he's one of the most confident guys that you'll find out there. He's going to, I think he's going to keep going. But like I said, it's interesting when it comes to that top three and put, I really do have to go back and check out Mike Sommerfeld now. So that would put you having... Chris, then Wesley, then potentially Mike Sommerfeld in third. Yeah, uh, or, uh, or or potentially Mike Sommerfeld, and then Urs battling it out as well, and then Breon and Ramon as well battling it out for fourth and fifth. I got a lot of shit over saying Ramon was going to take fourth, but I looking what looking at his updates versus the Arnold Classic that I just saw, and the fact that Urz is another dangerous guy right now, not showing anybody anything. He's just put his head down. He's putting in the work. He's putting on his triple XL T-shirt, and he's just going to. That's a that that's a dangerous guy, and he's a younger guy that has a lot of room to still potentially grow. If especially if he can bring up just the arms, man. That was a thing that people forget when you're thinking about the uh, classic physique. Uh, I know they gave them all in different heights, different amounts they could gain. For a couple of guys, it was, you know, seven pounds or three kilos. And for this guy, it was only two, but this guy was eight. Having that extra room to grow is oh, where yeah. it's huge. And Chris was close to maxed out. Ramon's close to max out. Uh, Urs, even if Urs stayed the same, it's not mature muscle yet. It's only going to look better as he gets older. Wesley, same thing. That muscle's so young. Matt Grego, same thing. Uh, there's another kid named Carlos Domar who's got beautiful shape and size that when the muscle starts to harden and get more mature, he's going to be wicked good. Oh, no, Matt another Grego's guy, a guy um, that I'm a big fan of too. Reno Frere, uh, I was emceeing the uh, Florida Pro a couple days ago. Uh, he needs to harden oh, yeah. up just a touch, but stunning shape. Another Brazilian guy, stunning shape. I don't know what they do down there. Uh, between wellness and uh, and classic physique, they turn out some great athletes. Nah, it is it, it is pretty crazy what they've been doing down there. Brazil really shot up in uh, in the world of bodybuilding. Um, St- Stefan Matala, he's an. I don't think that he's going to be in that top five or top six this year, but he's got great classic shape. And if it, him and Patrick Tor have really figured out the formula to bring in that hard grainy conditioning, I th- I'm looking forward to seeing Stefan this year too. Yeah, uh, Patrick does a great job with his athletes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, all of them. You know, he's got a couple of guys that, well, he's got, yeah, he's got a couple of guys in 212 that are really going to make some noise this year. 212 is going to be another really good one, man. Really 212 good. just at the top. Those guys, Bad Olympia Battle said a lot about those two guys, uh, Keon Pearson and Sean Clarita. And as hungry as Keon is to regain or retain that title, Sean is not someone who's it did not sit well with him not being Mr. Olympia, not being the 212 champ. So he is they're both that was 
five weeks, six weeks ago we filmed that, they were both almost yep. ready to walk on stage. And that would have been 10, 11 weeks out from the big show. Did you get a look at Sean by chance? Did you get to see yes, him? I did. You did. Yes, did. Tim, tell me what's going to happen. Dude, I have no idea what's going to happen the night of, the morning of, the the water, the this, the that. But it's going to come down. I promise you it will be a one or two point decision. I promise you. Okay, so Keon looks bigger than he's ever looked and was grainy through his shirt. Sean had 11 weeks out. Sean was already vascular through his sweatshirt. He had a like an old school cut off neck cuts thing with the, the and it was already like vascular through thick clothes. These guys are going to come in rocked. Uh, Sean came in heavier last year and he realized size wasn't the key. Uh, but I know he put on another pound or two of quality muscle because he's got like 20 under the 212 range anyway. Oh, yeah. He's going to come in probably 187, 188 instead of 192, and he's going to look insane. The only thing that I saw was he posted an update where he was training forearms, and you could see the forearm flexing through. And <laughs> the the forearm is stri- – there's there's striations in the forearms. The, the he, vascular he the roller the roller thing he was doing? That was one thing he was doing, but it was a three in one machine, I think it was. So he was also doing he was also doing flexes just to, as an individual as well. And it was I was like, this guy really is not messing around this year, man. Like he's another oh. guy that wants it back very, very bad. Not seeing anything from him, no updates, nothing like that. Put his head down and just going to work. And he's still like he's another guy that's training really, really hard right now. I'm I'm excited uh, as a fan in any direction to be a part of this, but knowing there are battles in women's bodybuilding, women's physique with Sarah and Natalia, oh, yeah. um, figure it'll be interesting to see what happens at the top of figure if Sid just continues the sweep. Uh, wellness is going to be a battle. Bikini is wide open with Jennifer Dory out. You've got five girls. You've got five ladies up there that have all been bikini Olympia. Five former Olympia champs. That's insane. And then you've got a girl like uh, Laura Lee Chapatos, who's won the Arnold uh, Fitness International for Bikini International three times, including this year, which is always kind of that precursor to how you're going to do with the Olympia. It's going to be a five-way war in bikini. That's unbelievable. For the 68th Olympia, there are a lot of stories to go along with this year in almost every single division. And that doesn't happen very often. I mean, with the improvements that we're seeing from everybody in the open, Sean Clarita wanting his title back, Wesley Vissers that just won two Arnold Classics and and leapfrogged some of the top guys in the division to start chomping at the bit for the champion out there, the most dominant champion to ever grace the division. Like you said, all of the women's divisions there with Jennifer Dory sitting This Olympia really does have a lot, a lot to consider going into it. And it makes it very, very exciting for the fans. You're at, at heart, I can tell. There's no question. You're just a big fan yourself. You're just a big fan yourself. This has to be one of probably. Uh, it, it must be one of the most exciting ones for you to be a part of. In I don't even know how long it would be. Um, 20, well, twenty six years. I think back to when Cutler and Ronnie were on stage together, and I was the MC. And I don't think I even had the appreciation then that I have now, or things were such a blur. Like I was so numb back then thinking, don't screw this up. Don't screw this up. Uh, Don't, don't say the wrong name. Don't, don't give the wrong third place to the wrong guy. And I just went through the motions. I think now I'm more aware of how awesome this is and how badass it is to be a part of this. Um, And the friendships that I've made over the 25, 30 years, to have so much investment in hoping that this guy wins and this guy, you know, nobody, I'm not hoping for anybody to lose, but I have so many friends that'll be in the top three that I go, Oh, somebody I like one. Shit. I know. I know what you mean. Even the short period of time that I've been covering this sport, I've got guys like, like when Tony o told me he was out, I was like, Oh man, that's another guy that I just, okay. I can't really cheer. Kareth Bajo. Who's going to be fighting for a top three. I was like, man, I like, I got to be rooting for the guy. You know, he's a buddy of mine, you know, like, watching Robin no, Strand do shows this year. Yeah. You've got Kareth top three, right? Oh yeah, I do for yeah. sure. Yeah. No question. Kareth is another guy who as humble as he is, you know, 
he's he's ready for war, man. Like he's been really, <laughs> really working. That guy hasn't been out of shape all year. He has not been out of shape, you know. He's he's I, fighting I'm hard, excited. man. I'm you know, and being a physique guy, um, uh, it's really hard for me not to be just. I've always loved that division, even though it's relatively new. Um, but it made me happy. I, I've got some injuries. I can't really, I can't top load and train heavy squats. And, uh, I still train legs, uh, which is a running joke for physique guys. Um, and they actually tried to balance out the division this year with some new rules, but at the same time they put in weight categories for the, or weight, uh, weight limits for the pros. Yeah. Um, but I've been waiting for Ryan Terry to claim that title for a long time. And he set a new standard last year a standard that guys like Ali Bilal are going to duke it out with him. Aaron Banks just posted a back shot the other day that tells me if that was his issue before, it's not now. Dude is serious. And that's a division that I don't get into a lot because you can only cover so much is one thing. And, uh, you know, I'm still admittedly, I will admit, a little bit too caught up in the previous mindset of men's physique being what it was when it first started, you know, being that division, you know, kind of lame kind of thing. Men's it's, bikini. Yeah. It's not like that now at all. It's like, I actually do enjoy the men's physique at the Olympia. It's, it's a very, very competitive division these days. These guys are jacked. They're massive. The backs. I mean, any fan of bodybuilding can easily look at men's physique, even if you're a casual fan, and appreciate what these guys look like these days. Hell, they had to put in the weight limit because these guys were getting too big, you know? It was classic physique and board shorts. Yeah, it was, yeah. And now, and especially that, where the legs have to fill out the short... How do you feel about that now where they say that the legs have to be proportionate? I respect it for uh, the premise of being a fit, well uh, physique. Um, yeah. It's nothing that a little couple extra sets of leg extensions and some sewing can't fix for me. Uh, you know, a little nip tuck here, you know, tighten up the shorts, mama. Uh, we can yeah, make well. it happen. No, I, I, I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, I also know these guys train. That was the old school thought too, is these guys don't train hard. They don't train heavy. They don't throw weights. Yeah. Everybody, every division is busting their ass. I've watched, uh, one of my other favorite divisions for the last 30 years has been fit, uh, fitness. And these girls train heavy hard they've got to do routines they've got to come in shredded i've watched some of the bikini competitors like laura lee chapatos a couple of weeks ago she, they were out there for the uh olympia battle she trains like a beast you know she's doing heavy 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 everything that she can and mad respect to the people getting on stage at this level 100 percent. oh yeah i've got respect for anybody that walks up on that stage i don't care what division it is like mad respect you know mad respect but no, it really is going to be a very, very exciting 60th Olympia. And uh, I'm glad that uh, glad to hear that you're going to be doing some commentary there with, uh, you know, some legends of the sport as well. Phil Heath, Sean Ray. That's really going to be fantastic. I, uh, I'm i really looking forward to seeing that. Um, and like I said, Olympia TV is something that people can go and tune into between now and the Olympia to uh, get some of the up to date coverage. You guys just finished some episodes uh, filming. They'll be coming out here soon. The last four days, we really break down. There's an episode two or three days out from the Olympia. I think it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday where we go class by class and make our prognostications and say, hey, here's what we think for open, classic, 212, fitness, figure, bikini, wellness. So uh, check out those episodes. Do your do your last minute cardio before you get on the plane to Vegas and, and check out our, our guesses. Last question for you, Tim. I've got one last question. If the job came up here for the Olympia MC position, if when Bob Chicarillo decides that that's going to be it, not going to do it anymore, do you think you're next in line? I think I'm someone they would call, but I think I think there's a couple things at, at work here. Bob and I have talked for years. Bob, uh, uh, is is um, I don't even want to go there with with any negative on this. Bob has been incredibly good to me for a very long time. He's he's a guy that'll call me up and go, bro, you want to go to Minnesota? I got a gig for you. And there's not a lot of guys in a lot of industries without any jealousy that'll look out for each other the way Bob, and for that matter, for Sean, have looked out for me over the last 25 years. Uh, Bob and I have talked and said, hey, man, when the day comes, when one of us has to go, we should probably both go. Um, but I have expertise being on TV uh, for 20 years that I hope is more valuable in the broadcast booth 
with being able to work with the producers in the in the truck and the and the directors and the things going on. And uh, I don't know who the next in line is if I don't take it, but I think I'm hoping my talents are better served where they have me. Uh, I, I, if I know anything, I know Dan Solomon, uh, who I've also had a massive brotherhood and respect for, for 20 years. The guy knows where to put people. He knows where to say, all right, that is a square peg for a square hole and a round peg for a round hole. They go there. Um, so he knows he, he has an idea what's best to answer your question. I don't know that I would go back to it. And for that matter, at this point, I don't know that I'd want the stress. Back when I was doing it, it was stressful as hell. Um, and they want that thing to run like a clock. And uh, I could do it. I don't know if I want to. You make really good points about being able to play to your own strengths as well. And not just your strengths, but where you're interested in placing your efforts as well. I think that that's something that some people go their entire lives and don't recognize. And I think it's part of why you've been so successful in this industry, you've had a lot of experience when it comes to your stage time in various aspects of, like you were saying, comedy and now uh, bodybuilding, commentating, the Olympia TV. But all of that experience, competing, of course, being a, being a gym rat yourself, all of that, you found a way in order to compile it into something that you really get to enjoy doing, get paid to do it, and you get to scratch that itch of being a fan of bodybuilding every every single day it really is a very admirable career before you wrap kenson and i appreciate that uh my one of my best friends carmen who's the the comedian who's been my mentor for the past 35 years as the one that told me to go towards the bodybuilding thing he thinks this entire process is like somebody who's infiltrated the mob and become a mobster like donnie brasco <laughs> when the, when Donnie Brasco infiltrated and went native and all of a sudden he's doing a hit with the guys and go, you were an FBI agent. You're doing a hit. Yeah. I got comfortable. I I've learned to love it here so much that I could probably do a hit. I don't know. I love it. It's just one of those things that <laughs> I'm in now and I'm not going to rat. No, no, I get you. I get you completely, but it really is uh, really is interesting to, you know, find out some of the little, uh, little things behind the scenes when it comes to Olympia TV and really you drawing on, like I said, all your experience in order to bring it to where you are now. It's, uh, it's very, very entertaining to watch you on Olympia TV and to be able to see you again here for the Olympia broadcast this year. I'm really looking forward to that. Like I said, everybody make sure to go to subscribe to the Olympia TV channel, pay-per-view for the Olympia, all the information you can find at, uh, at, uh, I believe it's olympiaproductions.com. Um, I'll put the website in the description below as well. Uh, Tim, um, how do people get a hold of you if they're uh, if they're looking to do so? Uh, Instagram is the best way now. Uh, at uh, Tim Wilkins underscore live, you put in Tim Wilkins. By the time you get to that point, I'm usually the first face that comes up. Uh, say hi if you enjoy the show. Uh, definitely say hi if if you don't. Just you know, uh, oh, bro is yeah. enough. Keep it um, to yourself. Yeah. It's for the best. No, I, I love hearing from everybody. And uh, I just love being a part of the sport, man. I really appreciate you having me. It's great talking with you. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm really glad uh, that I had you on, Tim. We'll uh, we'll have another chat here soon. We'll get we'll get through the Olympia and then we'll uh, we'll see about wrapping it all up. And, and we'll share uh, how we did with our Ramon Dino pick and how much Brazilian hate we get. Uh, yeah, we can compare. We'll see who uh, we'll see who gets more hate. But uh, guaranteed it's coming. <laughs> Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. We'll talk to you soon.